think it's going to do very, very well. I think that we are going to be in a position to pass something as early as next week, which will be monumental. I think it'll get worked out one way or the other, but it's going to take it's going to take good faith on both sides to be able to do it. The tax reform bill is a disaster. It helps the wealthiest, most powerful corporations and individuals, and it hurts the middle class. I think maybe the most important element people aren't yet thinking about is this April 15th, when you file your taxes, that is the last time you will file under this monstrous broken tax code. Well, it's in. It's done. They've finished the negotiating and it is locked in stone. Right now the bill has been filed, the tax reform bill in the House, uh, expecting a vote early next week. And here are the details. We put them up before. Seven tax brackets, top rate individually at 37 uh, percent, taking that down from 39.6. Uh, doubles the standard deduction for single filers and married couples, lowers the corporate tax, as we talked about, to 21%. That begins January 1st, 2018. Uh, you, you have a continual uh, write-off for state and local taxes up to a certain amount, expands the child tax credit, and that was a sticking point, eliminates the corporate AMT, continues the charitable deduction contributions, provides immediate relief for from the death tax or the estate tax by doubling the amount of the current exemption, eliminates the Obamacare individual mandate penalty tax. Today, uh, we heard from Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Bob Corker, who were saying that they were no's and they are now yeses, and that changes the entire math. Let's bring in the panel. Steve Hayes, Editor-in-Chief for the Weekly Standard. Leslie Marshall, syndicated talk radio host, and Charles Hurt, opinion editor for the Washington Times. Long time coming, Steve. Uh, this is finally in stone, and it seems like the momentum is is kind of unstoppable right now. It's It seems like that. I mean, of course, we thought that before, and then things have, the, the obstacles have presented themselves. I think nobody's happier about this than Charlie Hurt, who finally <laughs> saw that top rate go from 396 <laughs> to 37. Um, Still too high. I know, you want to bring it down even further. Um, look, I, I think this is, overall, for Republicans, this is important for a couple reasons. One, um, they, it will likely have some economic benefits. This is what Republicans have argued all along. They disagree uh, about exactly what the economic benefits will be and how stimulative it'll be in the short term. But there will be some stimulus. And two, of course, it gives Republicans something to take to voters. And uh, that's going to be very important. I think the additional, the inclusion of the expanded child tax credit that Marco Rubio and Mike Lee fought for um, really all along, but made a hard push for starting beginning this week in a meeting with Senator McConnell. Marco Rubio made the case, said he was going to be a no. It turned out to be a threat that he intended to carry out um, and won the argument, I mean, won the battle. Uh, I think that's going to be uh, helpful for Republicans as they make the case that this is something for families in the middle class. And that debate played out today, Senator Portman and the president on this. And in terms of the child tax credit, I think you'll see some improvements there for folks who are at the lower end of the economic ladder. So I think it'll be a very popular bill, and uh, among our Republican colleagues, I think we'll get the votes. The Democrats have done nothing in terms of children, in terms of child tax credit. We're putting in a tremendous child tax credit, and it is increasing on a daily basis. So it, it goes to 2,000 and now up to 70 percent for the lower income uh, can can essentially be paid out off of this. And again, I don't look. There is some stuff in here that's good, and certainly stuff that's in here that is good for you know my husband and certain people in certain tax brackets. I don't think it addresses all of the concerns that the middle class, especially the blue collar working class, that put Trump over into that White House with their votes. What do they want? They want job. They want to see money in their in their fists. They're not getting a check that's cut for two grand. That's a whole different story when you break it down over twelve months. And when you look at deductions, they are for the rich. I mean, what type of people are itemizing their deductions? Uh, lower middle class Americans in this country aren't doing that. So I don't think it's going to help them in the midterm election. I don't think the child tax credit is enough. Uh, not just that. In addition to that, the polls just show it's not as favorable to the American public. And at the end of the day, this is, hey, look, we finally did something for Republicans. But how much of it is politics, since they can't even really pay for this, sure. uh, versus in the best interest of their constituents? On the public polling, I mean, it's pretty complex to, to yeah. tell in an elevator story. If at, at by the time you get to 2018 and it sinks in in February or March and the economy is rising further than even it is now, um, 
that one would think would have benefits across the board. Absolutely. And of course, the reason that it's so complex to explain uh, in, in simple terms uh, in the first place is because the stupid tax code is so freaking uh, impossible to understand uh, in the first place. And, and very wealthy people have to hire people to come and, and suss it all out and I, figure out how. I love your passion on this. <laughs> I, it's, it's unbelievable. But, but, I do, but I do think that, uh, but I do think you're exactly right. If at the end of the day, this does help the economy and those people do get some of those jobs and you still and all you have is Democrats sitting on the sidelines and talking about class warfare even though the, their economic improvement uh, uh, situation is improved and talking about Russia 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 I think it has a tremendous impact to that point uh, a little montage of the president interacting with the press on the South Lawn this morning it's a shame what's happened with the FBI but we're gonna rebuild the FBI it'll be bigger and better than ever I think he should. There is absolutely no collusion. That has been proven. My worst enemies, they walk out, they say, there is no collusion, but we'll continue to look. That was the call of part of the solution. It was great. Um, he uh, said very nice things about what I've done for this country in terms of the economy. I don't want to talk about pardons for Michael Flynn yet. We'll see what happens. Let's see. So a lot of coverage today about not a pardon yet for Michael Flynn, no collusion, absolutely no collusion, which he said before, and uh, following up on the FBI. And then he went to deliver a speech at the FBI, which he praised heartily. It was, it was the, he, what he, the remarks he made in, to the agents and the people that work hard every day to, to uh, carry out the mission of the FBI couldn't have been more complimentary and positive. Uh, and so he left all of his uh, stinging rebukes for the uh, upper echelons of the FBI on, on the White House lawn, which I thought was probably a smart way of handling that. Leslie. Well, they weren't in the audience, right? At the last minute tip, they said, there's not enough room. You know, you guys can uh, stay. Not that they were going to come anyway. Um, look, I, I think the whole email thing is stupid. I think it was stupid for the two people to be corresponding like you this. Mean the text, text yeah, 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 the yeah, 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 yeah. Text messages, you know, emails that they had to one another. Uh, it, the reality is that whether we work inside the Beltway or outside, we have opinions and we have political opinions and political leanings. And there are a lot of people that know, even Republicans who don't favor this president or some of the things that he says. But, you know, these individuals also, you know, bash Democrats, Eric Holder, Chelsea Clinton, uh, the list goes on. The problem that I have with what we saw, the montage and other things that the president has done is it's do you believe him then or do you believe him now, right? I mean, because he's, you know, rebuking the FBI and then he stands there in front of law enforcement and talks about what a great law enforcement team that we have in this nation as we do and forgetting that FBI is part of that great big law enforcement team. Uh, the same thing uh, with Roy Moore. Uh, I back the guy. You know, he denies it. He said he didn't do it. I backed the guy. I'd rather have a Republican. You got to concede. You know, I, I mean, he, he goes, he flip flops. So well, he had already made his. the call to Doug Jones to, to congratulate him Correct. on his win. Right. Right. Uh, Steve. Yeah, look, I think <clears throat> the issue with the text messages is whether these private views, which I think virtually everybody agrees that they're allowed to have, affected their judgments or their actions in carrying out their responsibilities as public servants. And I think there are texts that suggest they might have. It's worth uh, looking into. I don't think the president should have answered the question about a pardon for Michael Flynn the way that he did. It's not appropriate for the president of the United States to say that he's considering uh, a pardon for Michael Flynn, even as he's saying he's not considering a pardon for Michael Flynn by saying yet. Uh, he should have just passed on the question. He should do that next time he's asked, because he'll be asked again. And you look at what's going on in Chicago, what the hell is going on in Chicago? What the hell is happening there? For the second year in a row, a person was shot in Chicago every three hours. You don't think these people in this room can stop that? They'd stop that. You uh, recently declared Chicago schools a Trump-free zone. The city of Chicago, yeah. The whole thing? The whole thing, man. What is that? Our motto? A city he'll never sleep in. We don't want him, man. All right, Chicago, that's where we start the, uh, the lighting round. The murder, the crime rate there, Chicago murders so far, 628 in 2017 uh, compared to 731 in 2016. Uh, but that stat that the president used is accurate every three hours. Charlie. 
Yeah, I don't know why anybody uh, like Rahm Emanuel wants to pick a fight with this president because he's going to hit back. He always does. Uh, and it's a good point. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Chicago is a petri dish of, of policy, democratic policies uh, and gun laws to, uh, in particular. And it's a disaster, as it is in many other cities just up the road in Baltimore has yeah. a high murder rate. Number one, we were talking off the air, right, almost, almost double. Um, I'm from Boston that has extremely, and Massachusetts has extremely um, uh, strong gun control policies, and Boston wasn't on that list of top 30 uh, dangerous cities, so I don't like that argument of every time it's a blue state or a blue governor, I don't buy it. What I do buy, if we look at the Detroits, the Chicago's, the Baltimore's, and they always love to mention Chicago, a city I love and lived in for four years, is they don't look at the multifaceted problem. It's not just about guns. There's drugs, there's poverty, there's unemployment within the African American community. And we cannot be, uh, we have to admit that this is a problem with the African American community because these are disadvantages that this community has in all of these cities. And Chicago is a big part of that. This is not the end of this topic. Uh, another topic, however, Iran and its activity in Yemen. And the U.S. comment about that. These are the recovered pieces of a missile fired by Houthi militants from Yemen into Saudi Arabia. The, miss the missile's intended target was the civilian airport in Riyadh, through which tens of thousands of passengers travel each day. Just imagine if this missile had been launched at Dulles Airport or JFK. It's hard to find a conflict or a terrorist group in the Middle East that does not have Iran's fingerprints all over it. it was a strong speech by Nikki Haley. Uh, the response by the Iranians, the Zarif, the foreign minister, when I was based at the UN, I saw this show and what it begat, uh, pointing back to pre-Iraq war intelligence. Yeah, well, it's a dodge. It was an important speech from Nikki Haley, and it's important that the Trump administration is doing this. For the better part of eight years, the Obama administration ignored the fact that Iran was the leading state sponsor of terror in the world. James Clapper at one point even wrote out Iran, largely Iran's terror activities, of the threat assessment that he provided Iran, and it was a big stink in Congress. We need to be calling out Iran at every stage. It's important to provide people the evidence of what Iran's up to with respect to terrorism globally, with respect to troublemaking regionally, and more broadly, what Iran is up to with its nuclear program. All right, a lightning uh, winners and losers. Steve, you start. My winner uh, this week is Sassy. Roy Moore's horse, who is never again going to have to survive the public spotlight. And apparently some awful riding by Roy Moore. I don't know anything about this, All right. but I'm told. Loser. Loser is Steve Bannon, uh, who I think may have learned a lesson about not backing credibly accused child sexual predators. Okay. Lightning. Uh, loser. Uh, winners, I would say, are African-American women in the state of Alabama who showed when that, you know, you come out as part of a population and certainly the gender, we women, uh, that we can prevent uh, alleged uh, child molesters uh, from becoming senators. And losers, speaking of, Roy Moore, not a senator, not even a judge. Take the judge off your Twitter account and he has to concede. Winner and loser. L loser of the week is the FBI. Jim Comey and, and um, Bob Mueller have done more to discredit the agency uh, and the hard work that so many people people do uh, more in the past week than, than ever before. The winner is deep state because uh, watching Rod Rosenstein's testimony and the frustration, you've got Republicans in charge of Congress and the White House and the, 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 the stonewalling and the inability to get the uh, questions answered uh, proves that the deep state is here to stay. But we should say there are good people at the FBI. Well, I, I, tried, I meant to say that if I okay, did. Okay, I just wanted to help. Thank you. When we come back. <laughs>